All right, so we look at what makes a gift a gift last time when we finished and we talked about how it is that a gift is unconditional. That's the definition of a gift. If you, if you put any condition on a gift, then it is no longer a gift. Then it's just like a contract. That you, you scratch my back, I scratch your back, and then we all benefit. But a gift given it is when you don't expect anything in exchange. So that's what we talk about what baptism is um, and God's, God's mercy and grace for us is a gift because he is not expecting anything from us. He is not, he does not have any uh, requirements or demanding anything from us. So that is a, a sacrament is, that's why they are called the means of grace. So now we are going to go into something a little different than than what um, a gift is for, let's see. For, and then I am going to uh, look at what it is, who, who I, I looked into <laughs> for this, um, this study. Uh, it was uh, a book about believers' baptism. So then uh, we have a lot of contention about what baptism is and what baptism does. So and we have uh, four, four different main, main ideas, which is a pedo baptism, which is infant baptism done onto a child who has no ability to decide or has any reasoning. Then we have the adult baptism, someone who has not yet been baptized and then re uh, request a bat baptism. But this is not necessarily a decision baptism that, you know, I waited because my parents told me that I needed to wait and make the decision for myself. That could be either way, you know, I was never baptized, I was never brought to church, and then a friend brought me when I was 15, and then I got baptized. And then believer's baptism, that is, you know, waiting for the child to come to a time of reason. Okay, so that child is able to reason, to decide and to understand what uh, that child is doing. And then they can get baptized anytime after that. Um, after someone decides they have, they are able to reason and to make that decision, you know, to decide to receive Christ, invite Christ into their hearts and whatnot. And then a re-baptism, that, that's a different, another, another story. It's when somebody comes to a church and says, well, I was baptized as a baby. And then that church says, well, that's not bad because you don't have the prerequisites for A, B, C, and D. So then that's not valid. So if you accept Jesus and then you make the decision, then we'll baptize you. And then, then you, that baptism is bad. So then, and then there is another one yet that uh, this uh, author pointed out about some Pentecostal churches that um, they even separate that uh, uh, the Holy Spirit from baptism from from every every uh, everything else that they have set up. Yes, I've never heard of that re baptism. The, the logic behind it is that uh, churches say that it's a more the what it was called the Anabaptist, so Baptist churches. Oh, that's kind of changing. So the Anabaptist mm -hmm. was in the time of Luther, which it uh, so that's the I don't know if everyone does it the same way, but it is well that's full immersion, isn't it? And you have to be a teenager or something to you can decide. Yes, and you and then you have to have the full immersion because Jesus was immersed in, in the Jordan River. So he has to be immersion. He cannot be the way you know we do it usually with water on the head because that, that's not what Jesus did. So if that's more legalism. So you're going to look at more legalism and then you're also uh, going to see that um, that it's going to be more uh, more of, um, of an issue because if you want to do it the way Jesus did it, you have to go to the Jordan River. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't want to use a few hours. <laughs> oh, yeah. But I have a real, real quick story. It's, it's, it's kind of, it's funny, but uh, well, it's funny now. It's more funny now, but I had a family who, who wouldn't come to church very often, and then they would only come to baptize their children. And I was at that church for two years because that was my transition church from Guatemala to Minnesota. And then this um, couple came and the mother would, would come to church a little more than the father. But then he had gone to uh, Israel and then he bought a vial of water from the Jordan River. So then he said, I need this water, this special water to go into the baptismal water so that my child is baptized with this special water. I was like, okay, that's fine, not a big deal. And so we poured it in. <laughs> and then the, the person who was the, the baptism uh, organizer, at the end of the service, she comes, grabs the, the basin, and then dumps the water in the, in, in the sink. And then she comes running like, where's the water, where's the water? My husband needs, you know, needs to take the water back, you know, like, and then I'm like, sorry, you know, it's already down the drain. And then she's like, can I just take water from the faucet? He won't know. <laughs> so I'm like, great, let's do it. So she took water from the faucet and then here's your Jordan water, honey. And then so when we, we get into trouble, when we are very legalistic about something that is a gift, and then we make something more than it is by where it comes from, the, rather than the word that is being put into the sacrament. Yes. So I see a lot. My family um, were Episcopalians, mm -hmm. and they do christening with the babies. Okay. And I always thought I was christened, but my because I knew my brother was my younger brother. Was. Um, but so what do you understand the christening situation with babies? So I thought I didn't need to be baptized because I was christened, but then my, my auntie told me no, you were never christened. Um, but I I just I know they don't I think the Episcopalians still do it. I don't know. Yes, yes. So christening it should be a, a different word for baptism. I don't exactly know where it comes from, but a wild guess I would make is christening is uh, putting Christ on you. That sounds good. That sounds good. No, I, I'm just uh, <laughs> taking a guess. <laughs> yes. Well, what churches were you part of being baptized in the Jordan River? Uh, because that, first of all, think of the cost of mm -hmm. getting to Israel, and there's some political times you don't want to go there. Mm -hmm. So that would really limit the number of people. <laughs> yes. How much money do you have? And how politically savvy are you? Yes, yeah. So I know that some groups, um, some yeah, some groups, even seminaries take trips there. Yeah. It's not for the reason of baptism, but just to go into a remembrance of baptism because of the Jordan River, and then they have a full liturgy and ceremony. And I'm like, oh, I don't know what, what I think about that because then you're kind of making baptism into what we're going we're going to see here more of a symbol that could be a business too you can oh it is i want to talk about um, uh, i don't know if we still say this but for some denominations they say if you have a baby who passes without being baptized first they go i don't know where they go but they mm -hmm. don't uh, yeah, so is that still a practice? If a baby passes before they're yeah. baptized. So the Catholic Church used to say that that if you had a baby who that's why the nurses would be baptizing babies mm -hmm. in the hospital, that if you had a child, a baby or a child who had not been baptized, they couldn't go to heaven. Oh, okay. They went to limbo. Oh, to limbo. Okay. Yeah. So that's something that we don't know. No, that's some, that's an answer we cannot 
But that's a question we cannot answer with certainty because we don't know what happens. So we can we can assume, we can speculate what happens, and then we can say, well, they didn't go to heaven. And then um, we don't have a certainty there. So what we do say is that, well, the emergency baptism saying anybody can baptize in, uh, you have the water, you have the word, and you baptize. If that uh, is not possible, then we do not baptize the dead because that's, they're dead. So then what we say is that we do have a merciful God who has come in Christ Jesus. God the Son has come, has died, and he comes from the other side of the grave. And then he will deal with those people who we cannot reach anymore. And that is not for us to, to decide. Uh, it is not the complete certainty that we have. You have been baptized, Christ chose you, Christ elected you, but we do know that Christ went, uh, died, went to hell, he preached and to the, the captives, and then he resurrected. So we know that he can do what we can't, going to the grave and back. So then he's, he comes from the other side of the grave where he will do what he will. And then knowing that uh, God is a merciful God, that we could be, that we can be uh, pretty certain that uh, he will have mercy on those who were not baptized. Now, um, when he was a thief on the cross, he probably wasn't baptized. Mm -hmm. He was immediately saved. Mm -hmm. So again, Christ is the last word. Yes, yeah, Christ is the last word. Yep. Yeah. Yes. You know, I'm just curious of your thoughts, because sometimes I talk to folks and they make it sound like baptism is like insurance. Oh. As long as I'm baptized, I'm good. I can do whatever. Uh, I mean, so if you're baptized, did you live a morally decadent life and you reject everything? I mean, it's God claims everybody, and I understand that, mm -hmm. but it's not, I don't see it that way. Do you, I mean, what are your thoughts on that kind of odd take on it? <laughs> well, and, and that is, that is uh, the, old, the old creature speaking. Well, I am, I'm good. I don't have to follow any rules. I don't have to do anything. Christ got me, and that's it. That's the, the old Adam speaking. Saying, well, you know, I, I go to church. I get forgiven. I go back to my old life. And then I'll come back maybe again to church to get forgiveness again. So and it, it is more of a, of, of a game, you know, of, a, of just, just, a, just nothing. Um, that doesn't mean that Christ's promise for that person is not there anymore. But um, that that person needs a preacher, that that person needs the word that if you lay down the law and say, now you have to do this. Now you have to demonstrate that you are truly a Christian. Then that bringing back what, what we are going to get to of the requirements of that, um, of what baptism is and then what baptism does. So then, uh, yeah, that's uh, the old Adam who needs uh, a word and it needs to be repented. And that might be that God will repent them at some point and then bring them back to to the word and and where, where wherever whenever we we have the word that that will be it um, but we usually say uh, god will bring them to the church because that's where we know uh we meet on sundays you know we know where we meet uh the, the word is preached and we meet at 8 30 and 11 so then we we have pretty a set a set time when, and that's why when we say uh, God will bring them back to church, it's because that's where the word is. Uh, we know that it's preached. So, yeah, that's something that that uh, people take lightly. And then when we and then they also push a little bit about, well, uh, so if grace is so free, that means that I can do anything I want. You know. So then that the pushback for then that they, they call that cheap grace. Mm -hmm. Oh, because it is cheap because if God did everything and then I don't need to do anything, then that's cheap. 
And then we say, well, grace is not cheap. You're right. Grace is free. So then what the word of God does what, what it says. And that's what we pray. And that's what, what we hope that will happen when we, we have a person like that in front of us and we're able to give uh, a word. Or um, if you cannot give it directly, uh, my professor would say, uh, you would sneak in the word in one way or another. Just, just throw a little bit, a little seed there. And then God will make it grow if God wills. So, yes. I think that's a very good question, Tyler. I thought we didn't distinguish between sins. We're all sinners. Mm -hmm. and we don't believe. That's that's what my interpretation. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, we don't grade uh, our sin against the other because if you sin, you sin, right? The difference is to have a a sinner. That, uh, that is not repentant and or has not been, has, doesn't have the word in their ear and a justified sinner. So we say, that's why Luther said, you know, we are, uh, the, the word, the, the way it's translated is saint and sinner, but in Latin is justus, which is justified and um, sinner. So, and we are justified sinners. We're not saints in the, in the sense that um, we do not sin any longer, but uh, that we are still in this, in this body. And as long as blood in, uh, runs through our veins and then air is in our, in our lungs, we will hear the word and we're created a new, a new creature. And that creature, that person will not sin. That, that person cannot sin. But then we are in this in this body, and that that person will sin. So that's why we have a hundred percent sinner and a hundred percent justified. The justified person will look for the word, will look for to do good without without being required. But the old person will, and then uh, the old person will look for recognition or to say, no, I don't have to do anything else. I'm good. I don't even have to go to church because they see it as a requirement as well. So it's, it's not, not working. When, when it comes to sin and uh, separation, that is uh, how I saw this from my life always, sin is there no matter what. Mm -hmm. But the Lord is the good part, and as a sinner, I'm on the opposite side. As soon as I sin, I separate myself from the good. Is there a clear motivation to separate yourself from the good? Nobody wants to do that. We do it unconsciously, separating us by sin from the good. Mm -hmm. uh, once you recognize that, you actually have a positive motivation not to sin because it's much better to be with the good because everybody wants to be around good. Everybody's been born to be good, but then we get tempted. We get um, taken away by powerful um, <clears throat> desires. Mm -hmm. When we look into the political arena, and then those those people are moving steadily away. At some point in time, some people can't even move back because then they lose face. So, in, in that, so, so in this, you are missing out on grace. And that's whenever we, we confess the, the usual, the, the standard confession, we say, we are captive to sin and we cannot free ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then, but, but Christ is merciful. And then the other, the, with that, um, Luther, that's why Luther said, no, we, we <clears> have uh, our sin is like a, in our sinful self. Is like a bag of maggots that we carry in our neck, just hanging from our neck. It's always there. And then we cannot bring ourselves to making good decisions or to making to bring ourselves to do good apart from Christ. We want to, Paul says that in Romans 7, I want to, but I cannot do that, which I like to do, but I, the thing that I hate, that's what I end up doing because we are being 
And the other part is that we are being, um, uh, Luther talks about uh, how Jesus walks into or rides a donkey into, um, into Jerusalem. And he says, well, we are the donkey in more colorful words. We are the donkey and we either have, we have two lords, either Jesus is riding us or the devil is riding us. And that's why we need Christ's word to uh, bind the strong man, which is the devil, and then for Jesus to take, um, to take over our life. And then that, in that way, that's where we, and that's it, the struggle. That's our, the cosmic battle between, between God and the devil and between in, us and our new self and our old self. That we're always struggling. I, I like to do the right thing, but I can't. Just think, for example, of something that you really want to eat and the doctor says, no, don't do it. <laughs> Can you get rid of that desire? <laughs> Not really. You, the desire is right there. And then you have the desire. And then you're like, oh, I wish I could. But the doctor told me, and yeah, he's right. Or she's right. And then you are able to, with the law, restrict your desire. But you cannot get rid of your desire. So that's why we have a bound will. We do not um, deny that we have a will. Many people say, oh, I have a free will and I can choose right from wrong. They say, well, you have a will, that is for sure, but it is bound either to God or to the devil, but it's not free. Yes, you had a Yeah, I read this thing and said, I can resist anything but temptation. <laughs> that is really good, yeah. yeah. But, um, I want to go there a little bit further into church history too, because uh, church has actually misused, in my eyes, this understanding what we're just trying to define. It's very difficult because we all carry this still on for hundreds of years. And we were warned, if you don't do this or that, you will not get into heaven. Mm -hmm. Well, the question is now, what is with Mr. Hitler? What is with Mr. Putin? Mm -hmm. what is with... They all were born as little children, and their mothers loved them, and they nursed them. And the father was uh, um, guiding them into life. Well, they never got carried away by powerful desires. Mm -hmm. They didn't care anymore about people. Mm -hmm. So are they condemned by, the, by, by Jesus Christ? Are they condemned by God? Well, I don't want to believe that because everybody gets to heaven in my eyes. Mm -hmm. Heaven is already here. Your choice, your punishment is basically your own choice. You separate yourself so far from God that you can't receive that grace which he's operating. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people, they screw up their life on earth so much that they uh, far away from that what is desirable. And uh, that is not what church has mm -hmm. taught for centuries. Uh, people were afraid. Mm -hmm. uh, I did something secretly and now I lost my chance to get into heaven. Yes, that, and that is that is a, an abuse of the, the, the church has committed uh, for people. And that's why Luther was so adamant about um, Salvation is only through Christ alone, and then, uh, and then we can go into the the whether you can you you can separate yourself uh, so far from God, and then so there is a saying, if I can remember correctly, that we think that we let's see, we are we are either so damned that that Christ cannot save us, or that we are so good. That we don't need to for Christ to even save us. So then we we have those two those two beliefs. So do your best, and you'll see it uh, um, here. It's the old the old saying from the Middle Ages that Luther um, dealt with, and that we still do deal with now. And then the church said, "Do your best, and God will do the rest." And then my question is, and how are you doing? Well, not not very not very well. 
I, I like to add to this uh, because we always have this big court coming up and then we are being judged. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ is our advocate. Well, in my understanding, um, in my belief understanding, that is that God will come and will embrace me and say, well, I'm so sad that you didn't see all these opportunities which you could have had. And you punish yourself for that, that lifetime which I gave you as a gift, and you didn't use it to your fullest expense. That is different than, okay, what did he do? This, 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 and this. So therefore, you go now the, in that corner of the hell, which were, which were people told and taught for centuries and sort of crowded to the last corner or before Luther came along. They, but they if paid you, all the money they had in order to get free of their sins. But if you still see it that way at the, at the core, there is still the same. The judgment is still there. You did not take the opportunity. Yeah. And if it if it relied on us, then we all would be condemned. But it is through Christ that we are not condemned. So uh, when we talk about judgment, and we'll see it a little bit more here, is that we think of judgment as something that will happen one day. So we receive baptism, we receive the Lord's Supper, and then we need to try, and then we need to do our best. God will do the rest. And then when the judgment time comes in Revelation, right, that we all are afraid to read Revelation, <laughs> it's uh, the second coming is here, and now you are in front of your Lord. And what will you say to your Lord? How would you stand before your Lord with all your sin that you know that you committed and you couldn't? Why don't you take the, the right steps right now? Make the decision for Christ. It sounds good, right? But then, if we are honest with ourselves, we go before the Lord, whether we try really hard or not, we are condemned. We are doomed. So then, a judgment, the judgment that we speak about is not a future judgment. Not that we are not saying that Christ will, will come again as, as we confess in the Apostles' Creed. But the judgment has already happened. And when has that judgment happened? When and where? On the cross. On the cross. And how, and, and Christ judged us. And how did Christ judge you? He died for my sins. Yeah, according to the law, guilty as charged. But according to the gospel, forgiven completely. So then this is when we see that if we want to cling to the law to make the right decision, and then God will have mercy on us. But we come from the cross forward. We're not going from an opportunity into a possibility. And that's what we will see. So. Judgment has already happened, and the judgment has been unjust. Because we deserve only punishment in hell. And according to the law, you did not fulfill the law. And the law demands how much? How, from 1 to 100. Percent. How much does the law demand? A hundred percent. How much can you achieve? Seven. Ten percent. Ten percent. Fifty percent. Eighty percent. And we hope that God judges us uh, and uh, grades us on a curve. Well, you know, I tried. Can you can you come a little bit closer to me? You know, I wasn't as good as my neighbor, but I wasn't bad at that name. So come on, give me a chance. So then Jesus judges us unjustly because he says, according to the law, you're doomed. According to my mercy, you are forgiven and have life in me. So then that's what we, we can see with Mark 16, 16, that he's taken apart and pulled apart and interpreted in a way that it's, it's, a, it's a step. It's a legalism in a requirement about our life. 
So then that's why they say whoever believes and is baptized shall be saved, but whoever does not believe will be or shall be condemned. So then we look at here of believers baptism by Marlin Jeski, or I don't know how to pronounce his last name. So he put together a little book and then he explained it in in one of the of in one perspective because there are many perspectives and uh, a little bit different details on this. So they just taking it from him that I, I can identify the sickness of of uh, baptism, how it is portrayed and taught. But then it, it was fun to see the, the symptoms of the illness and then how it is shown here. So these are the symptoms of, of a bigger illness. Um, so then uh, he divides it in four different ways. Acknowledgement of Jesus as Messiah, so something that you have to do. You have to acknowledge that Jesus is Messiah. You have to receive the Holy Spirit. And then you have to be incorporated into the messianic community, meaning a church. So that's a requirement in baptism. And then it requires a moral transformation or renewal. You have to show that you have changed. So then those are the, the four main things here. So then, and then I have a highlighted and put in bold some words because you will see them. So I want your reader to start going and then seeing what are those words and why they are there. So then the acknowledgement of Jesus as Messiah is that baptism signifies believing that Jesus is the Messiah and implies commitment to act accordingly, to take up something, to take on something uh, or to take up the messianic age or the messianic life, meaning uh, do as Christ does, or like the, the, the WWJD. What would Jesus do? So then you do the same, you know? So that's, that's what it, it, it is. So baptism does signifies discipleship of Christ. You have to be a good disciple. Who decides that? Well, the church decides that. You are a disciple because of, and then there have been even books written about the, what are the, the marks of discipleship. And then you go through a course, you take a course, and then you say, okay, so if, look at how many you have and what you're lacking, then work on it. So then, so that you are a true disciple of Christ. And then, so you need to be um, united with him, with Jesus, and demonstrate in one's life the nature of or mind of Christ. Yes. This looks a lot like you could swap it out and say this is like marriage. You got to pray. <laughs> you got to commit to each other. You got to follow your vows. You got to demonstrate that you're just that one person. That doesn't sound like baptism. It sounds like a man <laughs> different, you know? It like sounds like a contract. Yeah. Like a contract. Yeah. yeah. It is a contract because it is. So, yeah, you're, you're right. You're, <laughs> you put your finger on it. And then, so this is where, where the, the saying, comes from or you know where where it fits you know you must walk uh, not only talk the talk but you must walk the walk so it show me that you are truly a christian that you are truly baptized that you are truly committed and that's why they say you have to believe before you are baptized because if you don't believe you cannot do this you know you cannot commit so then what about children that 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 is only confusing to the point of you're baptizing babies. Mm -hmm. So and that's the that's the riff there. That would say they don't know. They don't know. They cannot reason. They cannot make a decision. They cannot commit. They cannot do this. So where are we placing our trust? Yes. Well, you are doing that. <laughs> We're bringing them to that. We're speaking for them. Yes, you are doing that, but who are they placing their trust? The better phrase. The children who are trusting us. No, no, it's so in this. Me, me, I have to do all these things, and I can do it by myself. So in this, in this regard, when they uh, put this in front of you and say, you cannot, you should not baptize children because they cannot reason. 
So then you have to make the decision. You have to make the commitment. So then that is putting the trust in yourself. Not that you're doing it, but that's what they want. You know, for, for people, for Christians to be true disciples, you have to do it. So then the trust comes back to myself. And then you have to make it work. So then uh, the reception of the Holy Spirit, baptism is an empowerment. An empowerment for what? So that you can do the first one. So that you can believe. So that you can be a good disciple. So it, this, the Holy Spirit empowers you. And then um, and the Holy Spirit is nice enough that he's going to walk with you. He's going to be a companionship to you. So that when you are uh, being tempted, you are able to fight off that temptation. So then to be baptized and to receive the Spirit means to be gifted by the Spirit, symbolized by the laying of hands, and ordained to a correspondingly appropriate calling or task. So you you have to was that vocation. yeah or, or vocation but that means more into the life of Christ mm -hmm. then then you you are tasked with um, whatever you your gifts are in that in that regard of vocation but in the church or spiritual gifts and then you need to work on that so this means that you must demonstrate your holy living which is the empowerment the Holy Spirit gives you. So the Holy Spirit empowers you so that you can have a, a holy living. So in here, that means that the Holy Spirit is not making you holy, but you, the Holy Spirit is helping you to become holy. So it is a process. It is a process that you need to follow. And as, as you keep working on yourself, then you'll get better, and then you keep improving. Right? So that's, that's the thought here. So in incorporation into the Messianic community, you are baptized, you are invited uh, through the gospel or uh, invitation of the gospel from someone who's already a member of that community. Um, you need to make an authentic confession of faith. How do you know when your confession of faith is authentic? Or better yet, can you know? I don't think so. <laughs> so, that's so, putting an off all responsibility. Can you really interpret yourself? But this maybe this moment you feel that like was, you know, life is like this. Exactly. Yeah. One time, one one moment you are really strong, you are going through a really hard time, and you say, No, God is with me, He promised, and I'm gonna go through it. Another time, you might be just desperate and you cannot even get up. So then that's, that is, that is the, those are the, the, the problems we run into with this type of interpretation of. Well, so, if you to change that last line, I don't understand. So finally, baptism, according to biblical thought, entails binding oneself to the regenerate assembly. So you have to come to church. You have to participate in church. And you have to, um, you know, you have, it, he says, you know, it's not about giving money. It's not about doing this. It's not about doing the other. But you have to have a commitment to the community. And you're getting regenerated as we well. To demonstrate, yeah. So you get regenerated. So in some aspects, yes, they have a language that, you know, it makes sense. Well, you are regenerated in the church or you are given new life in the church. You know, but what they're doing is, you need to work on it and then you keep each other accountable oh you know you are doing this wrong you need to be better and then so the accountability is follow the rules follow the rules and then you'll be better you place of tension all the time you felt like you had to be doing to somebody else is looking to see whether you really are and who are they yes yes yeah and, and this reminds me of a story of friends, dear friends that we had in Georgia, and we visited them. And the husband was uh, Lutheran, and the wife was Pentecostal. So then, uh, in the he would be invited to the Pentecostal church. Well, well, we'll get this Lutheran. We'll give him a pass, and then he can worship. But he's not truly in the community because he doesn't have the gift of tongues. You had to have the gift of tongues in their church. 
in order to demonstrate that you were truly a disciple of Jesus. So then he would get invited and be like, well, I don't have the gift of tongues, but they still invite me, so that's fine. And then uh, his wife would say, well, you know, our pastors are, are holy, are saints, are the best that we have, and they don't do anything wrong. And then he'd say, oh, <laughs> do you know that when, when, oh, and they don't drink and they don't do anything. And then he's like, well, why do you think they invite me to their, their, um, their, their pastor's retreat? Because I get to bring the wine. <laughs> and, and nobody else will see them. You know, if, if they went to buy wine and one of their parishioners, parishioners saw them, it would be the end of them in their church. So then he's like, well, let's not just get carried away and, and say that they don't even drink a little bit. You know, if, and it wasn't like they would get drunk. It would be like even enjoying a glass of wine. They couldn't even do that. But then the Lutheran, who was a heathen, you know, <laughs> then he could go and, and, and bring the wine, you know, very convenient. So then this is the last one, the moral transformation of the, or renewal of the person. So baptism in the New Testament means new ethical life. So that means moral life, you follow the rules. Baptism means death to an old way of life. See the difference? Not a death to the self, but a death of attitude, a death of those bad things that you did before, and now you are new. Called uh, regeneration, um, this entrance of a new life involves acceptance of a new master. So you have to accept. And then that's kind of like the altar calls, you know, do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And then you go and say, yes, I do. I repent of all my, my old, old ways of life. And now I will take on a new way of life. I will leave anything that, that is considered sinful. It can be from dancing to drinking to gambling to whatever. You know, so I won't do that anymore. And now I can show that I am committed. And then, so it is symbolized as putting off old garments and putting on new ones. The new ethical life is more than an, the absence of specified sinful acts, but the realization of a new nature. So that means that, that you need to make yourself new. So you got to work really hard on it. And then, uh, to, yeah, it is exhausting because I didn't, uh, in one of the, the inner terms that I did, there was a, a parishioner that who believed this. And then whenever we would meet and then he was having trouble with personal life, he would look like devastated. Like he was like dragging his feet, like I am exhausted because I cannot keep this part of my life straight. And then he tried, but he couldn't make it happen. So I'm like, so I would absolve him. And he would be, oh, thank you very much. And then we would disagree in, all, in different things. And then I would say, well, what you need to know is that Christ forgives your sin. He takes your sin from you and you are a new creature. The law does not belong in your conscience anymore, but um, in, your, in your appendixes. And then Christ is in your heart. And then he would be like, thank you very much. This is what I needed. But then he would go back to, to this again. So he couldn't, he was captive to his own devices. So when the religion say one again, that's sort of what they're referring to. Yep. That's you have to be born again. That means that you have to change your old ways and demonstrate to the church that you are a new creature by your by your fruit, by your doings, by your actions. And your church can have different criteria for what is acceptable. Oh yes, yeah. Depending on which community of faith you, yeah. you belong to. And because Christianity is the battle between law and gospel, it's going to be a lifetime of law and gospel. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> when you have to be said being baptized and a believer, 
That's a law firm. It is um, whoever believes and is baptized. So that that is the actually we'll we'll dig more into it in the, the following Sunday when we meet. But that is actually the promise. The commandment is go therefore and baptize in the name of and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That that's your command. You must do it. It's a loving command because if I don't tell you, you won't do it. And even when I tell you, you have a hard time doing it. <laughs> so then, yeah, it goes. It goes uh, from you know there are some some churches that uh, women cannot even wear makeup. They have to wear um, covering their their heads to you know different different ways. So they they decide which rules uh, apply to to their people. So that, yeah, so it is very much law driven. So it is exhaustive. So then a summary of the four essential aspects of a believer's baptism is baptism signifies believing. So it is a, a significance, implies commitment, um, signifies discipleship of Christ, um, signify it means to take up the way of Jesus, to demonstrate in one's life the, the nature of Christ, the mind of Christ. So you have to be like Christ. And that's a really high bar to <laughs> Uh, be said if before you baptism requires an authentic confession of faith again the authentic authenticity of your faith how do you know how do you know your neighbor is really truly uh repentant or truly believer you know it's it's that's when we start um, nitpicking and that's uh, the um, the the um country song that says you know that that the devil is in the details that's when when you get in trouble you start uh, pulling everything apart and then try to come up with your own formula so uh, again your life involves involves acceptance is that like that word you have up there called judgment yeah pretty much it's just pretty much judgment because the law what does the law do what is the function of the law in our lives to judge us to point out your sin so then uh being a good citizen uh means that when you get in your car you put on your seatbelt when you get to the to the um exit of of the parking lot you stop and you look both ways you get out and you are you see a red light you stop there so then that's that's the law pointing okay now behave and then as soon as you cross that, that street, you will see a, a speed um, speed limit. You better not go over it. <laughs> like, ah, okay, I, I was doing so well until you got me to the speed limit. Then you know, then I'll have to come back to get forgiveness. <laughs> Those signs are just suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> <That's the answer. laughs> yeah. Until the you know a, a blue and, and red lights or a, a red blue and red are symbols of freedom, right? You know, <laughs> until they are behind you flashing, behind you, then that's no longer freedom. <laughs> so in baptism is uh, oh symbol is symbolized as putting up the old garments and putting in new ones. So then it's a lot about you yourself and uh, me myself and I. What must I do? What do I have to? What do I have to give up and, and, and take on? So, and, but that's not all. He just keeps going, so it gets even more interesting. So, there are two aspects for a valid baptism, and that's when we get into more trouble because then they ask you, so when were you baptized? Well, you know, I was five, I was two, I was eight days old. Well, that's not a valid baptism because we don't know if you had grace, but we truly know that know that you did not have faith, because you're gonna see now that that's how they divide. So grace and faith are separate. Separated. Grace is God's action, and faith is the human response. So we go back again. They are not Roman Catholics. But they still use the same saying: "Do your best 
and God will do the rest. You know, both are essential for a valid baptism. Grace is prior to faith. Grace is the source of faith, and baptism takes place in the condition of faith. So if you don't have faith, you cannot be baptized. If you, if you don't demonstrate your authentic confession of faith, then you better not come because we won't baptize you. So then this is how it's supposed to work. That grace creates faith. Faith responds by confessing Jesus is Lord. The person's faith then desires baptism. Then the person says, you know, I believe, I confess Jesus is Lord. I want to get baptized. Then when baptism takes place, then the Holy Spirit is given so that the Spirit empowers you to become a better person every day. And then uh, you are grafted into the community, meaning now we welcome you as a full member of the church because you are like one of us now. And you need to demonstrate a moral, ethical life. If we see you coming out of the grocery store or the liquor store with a bottle of wine, then that's not a good sign, you know. Yeah, you can go to a grocery store, but if you step a foot in the liquor store, then you're out. And I'm just uh, making a, um, an assumption of what might be the, the rule for, for a specific community like that. So then this is what he has there, that faith is the actualization of grace. This means that grace and faith cooperate. So you, God gives you something, and then you give something to God. So then they are cooperating. Uh, grace is God's work and faith, human response. And then they all saying that which we still have, you know, uh, do your best and God will do the rest. There is a better one yet. Do your best and let God do the rest. So this is our problem a lot of the time that we um, we don't let God be God. God says something, we're like, well, you know. I don't agree with you, so I'm going to change uh, your what you're saying. So then we we put ourselves in the place of God, and we start calling the shots. So then to baptize where faith is not present is to violate the truth of grace, because it is to baptize where grace has not been realized. So how do you know that that's true faith? Or if they're just like, well, I don't want to get kicked out of the synagogue, so then I better show that I have true faith. And then I demonstrate a moral life. And then I do all this so that I don't get kicked out and I am grafted into this community. So then your motivation is to not be kicked out. So not to be punished, but to be rewarded, uh, to be received into this community. So then faith must be present at the time of the baptism, which testifies that grace has been at work and has produced faith. One has to demonstrate a transformation of the heart and mind first. So there's no Jesus in there. I mean, you, you, you confess, but there's no Jesus in any of those slides, mm -hmm. really. And, and they might, yeah, and, and then that's what I was reading. You know, I'm like, wow, so there is, God is there, but as a cheerleader. You know, God is giving you this, but you better respond. You know, so grace does come from, from, from God. Well, it's the Holy Trinity, too. I mean, it, it, it's the, the Spirit is there, mm -hmm. and, and, and God is there. The only part that's missing is right there is, is Jesus. <laughs> but he's the one who gives us the grace to move on to <laughs> yes. for salvation. So they do have all the vocabulary. So you see people talk about grace and faith in forgiveness and this and that, but then when you really look in, into it, it is legalism, it is pure law. Mm -hmm. So then Jesus is a taskmaster, and then you are the one who, who is being told what to do and how to do it. Well, and none of those slides have forgiveness in them either. Mm -hmm. It's nowhere in there. It's, it's <laughs> you're done, you know, it's like there's no second chance. That's <laughs> yeah, you're doing everything. I think we, we did this series. The church should not apply water except where there is, uh, where the church discerns the appearance of spiritual life. Where faith appears, the church should baptize to signify 
is recognition of God's gift of faith. So God's gift of faith, and they still say it's 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 a gift, but you better you better believe it, you better do it. So then we can summarize this uh, in this way: that uh, believers' baptism is a process of cooperation between God and humans. It is a hope for possibility and potential for the human being to choose right. So the Holy Spirit empowers, so the Holy Spirit is there, God is there, and then empowers humans to make the right choice for Jesus, as if Jesus depended uh, on our decision. And humans can change themselves into holy living. So one of the things that, that you did not see at all, and I didn't see at all there, is that they did ask the question, does baptism save? They gave three answers, no, four answers, and none of them addressed the question. They said, well, you know, if you have grace, then you'll have faith, and then if you make your commitment, and then you, if you're a good disciple, and then this, but the, the, uh, the question was never answered. So baptism does not mean salvation. So that's a big, a big thing, um, which also, um, which also gives you a uh, taste of what Mormonism is about as well. They say, well, Jesus is the son of God and he forgives you, but at the end, when you're dead and then you come to the, the judgment, then you are given another chance to make things right. And then if you truly decide to follow God and to accept God, then you will be in the first heaven. If you're mediocre, then you'll be in the second heaven. And if you really don't get it, then you'll be in the third heaven and there is no hell. And then the, the hell that, that they talk about is being ashamed of that you did not make the right choice when you were given so many chances. So then it flirts with that. So then this is uh, believer's baptism comes to which is not only baptism, but it's um, is the whole justification um, deal that God is giving you a chance. God is, um, there's still time. Choose now and choose right. So God is giving you the the opportunity to choose correct. And then what is it that we always ask from God? It's time. Just give me more time. I'll, I'll get it right next time. You know, um, I made my resolutions uh, the 1st of January, but I didn't, I couldn't follow them. So I have Lent, you know, but then, then summer comes. I did, I did well for 40 days, but then now summer, you know, it's yeah. kind of hard. And then you have Advent and then you have Thanksgiving and then you have Christmas and then everything went out of the window. So, so then you're always asking, we're always asking for second chances. So except this important little detail. So this is when we get into the, the realization that who, why, why is it that we are so, so separate, so divided in this? Because we go back to scripture and we say, it, Paul says in Ephesians, for by grace you have already been saved through faith, or even in the Greek it says, by, uh, by grace you are saved through faith. So there is no separation. And this is not your own doing. So you can't be clearer than that. It's not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works or your works. So that no one may boast, for we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So this is where where the reformers come back over and over again saying, we are not, we are being accused of not wanting good works. And that's not at all what we're doing. What we are doing here is making a distinction that your salvation does not depend on your good works, but on Christ alone. And when Christ comes by grace, um, we're not gonna have time to to go more in depth into this, but this is a good place where we can stop. But the definition of grace that we have is the disposition of God. God has made a decision about you. 
And through faith, he has saved you. Faith in who and in what? In yourself, in your works, but in Christ, who he has given himself completely for you, who has died on the cross, who has um, judged you unjustly, and who has said, this is my gift for you. And then if you if you heard the, the sermon today, it, it's that's that's going to be be demonstrated there about the the blind man. And then next week you will have uh, Lazarus. He was dead, and Jesus made sure that he was dead. He waited four days to make sure that he was completely and utterly dead. And then Jesus comes and does something. Uh, that it, 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 we can we can see as ridiculous. He says, "Remove the stone," and they're like, "But he stinks, Jesus. What do you mean? I mean, like he's already decomposing." And Jesus says, "Remove the stone," and they're like, "Okay, you say so." And then you, it's your nose. They remove the stone, and then he says, "Lazarus, come out." What can a dead man do? Not, much. not very much. He not, doesn't have very much potential or motivation. And Jesus does the impossible. Creates faith where there is none. Creates life where there was death. And then so this is where we are going to stop and then take on in two Sundays from now and look into why we believe uh, baptism is, is, is salvation. Why and how. And then we're, we're going to go back to scripture and we're going to um, build it on and seeing, seeing where it is not only in the New Testament, but also in the, in the Old Testament that we will draw from to lay the foundation for um, if we can get to what we have in the, in the small catechism. If you have any questions, you can write them down and then we can start with that um, in two Sundays from now. Yes.